As far as we know, we can't send messages faster than light. But in some special cases, a quick measurement with a random result will tell us the random result of another measurement taken at the same time light years away. This is quantum entanglement, when two or more fundamental particles have properties that are randomized but correlated with each other. The big hair man of science himself didn't like it, calling it spooky action at a distance. But today, I'm going to explain quantum entanglement and hopefully convince you that it is neither action at a distance nor is it spooky. To get quantum entanglement, we need to know the basics of quantum physics. So if you haven't seen that video already, I recommend giving it a watch. Here's a quick review. Space is filled with a bunch of overlapping fields. Particles are not dots, but waves in these fields. Quantum means smallest possible amount or smallest possible increase. The fields are quantum because for any individual wave, the total amplitude added up over the whole wave cannot be less than one particle's worth. When a particle interacts with something, such as a material or a measuring device, its wave function collapses, and it spreads out again as a new wave from that position. You can think of the height of a wave as its particleness. The higher the amplitude of the wave at a position, the more likely that part of the wave is going to interact instead of a different part of the wave. And when we add up the particleness over the whole wave, we get one particle. This gives us non-locality. A particle spreads out as a wave, but when it interacts, it interacts all at once. No need for the different parts of the wave to communicate with each other. That's the recap, but before we get to entanglement, there's another concept we have to look at. Superposition. So let's look at the classic, easy to understand example, electron spin. As we all know by now, an electron is not a ball, it's a wave, so it doesn't really spin. But it has a magnetic field as if it is a spinning charge. And the direction its magnetic field points, we call its spin. When an electron encounters another magnetic field, there are only two possibilities for the electron's magnetic field. It can either be aligned or anti-aligned, called spin up and spin down, respectively. They are the only two possibilities, and they have a 50-50 chance each. Thing is, before the electron enters the magnetic field, it is neither spin up nor spin down, but both, a superposition of up and down. When an electron enters a magnetic field, its spin collapses to either up or down, just like its wave collapses to a point of interaction. You might think, there's no way it can be both spin up and spin down at the same time. That's a contradiction. Therefore, before it entered the magnetic field, it must have been either spin up or spin down so that it continues to be the same thing in the magnetic field. But that is incorrect. And there's a famous experiment that proves it, the stern gerlach experiment. If we use a magnetic field to measure the electron's spin and then measure it along the same axis again, the first one will be 50-50, but the second one will be the same answer. But if we change the orientation of the magnetic field and measure its spin in a different axis, we get a 50-50 answer again. And if we measure it a third time along the same axis again, we again get a 50-50 measurement. Measuring the electron spin along a different axis resets the randomness for the original axis thus proving that it is, in fact, random. It is, in fact, a superposition. In summary, quantum superposition is when a particle has two states that seem to contradict each other at the same time, such as an electron having both spin up and spin down. When a property in superposition is measured, it collapses to one of the possibilities. Now, to pull together everything we've learned, particle waves, non-locality, and superposition, and finally get to the topic of today's video, quantum entanglement. Sometimes, when a particle in superposition interacts with another particle or a group of particles, its wave function doesn't collapse. Instead, the superposition spreads to the other particles. 
In other words, the particles become entangled. Let's look at the classic example. If we get two electrons to become entangled with one another, such as being in the same orbital in the same atom, their spins will be opposite one another. The first electron will be in a superposition of spin up and spin down. The second electron will be in a superposition of spin down and spin up. Even when the electrons are in superposition, they're opposite. This means that when you measure them, you will get a random answer. But the random answer you get will always be opposite. This is true no matter where the electrons are in the universe. You and a partner could be light years apart and measure your electrons at the same time and you would still get opposite random answers. The bottom line is if you have two entangled electrons and you measure one of their spins, you know what the measurement of the other one will give if and when it is measured. And I should mention that this is only valid once. Once an entangled property is measured, the entanglement is broken, and if we want the particles to become entangled again, we have to bring them back together again. That's the phenomenon of entanglement. But how does it make sense? To get a feel for what's going on, we have to remember that particles are really waves in quantum fields, and these waves are non-local. When a particle wave interacts, the entire wave collapses without having to send a signal to the rest of the wave. Entanglement is the same thing. Entangled particles are one wave with two particles worth of information. That's how they teach it in quantum physics class. I don't get why they don't teach it that way to the public. Actually, yes I do. Spooky stories get more fun thing. When you measure the spin of your electron, that part of the wave collapses, setting in stone that when the second electron's spin is measured, its spin will collapse to the opposite value. And there you have it, quantum entanglement explained. Multiple particles, one wave. If you've been following along, you might have a question. When a particle interacts, what determines whether its wave function collapses or whether it gets entangled? That, my friends, is the famous measurement problem. And we'll talk about it when we get to our video on interpretations of quantum physics. Now for the question on all of you sci-fi writers' minds, how do we use this for faster than light communication? The answer, we don't. If you have one end of an entangled pair, you can do two things with it. Watch it, in which case it will do nothing, or measure it, in which case you'll get a random 50-50 answer. You can know what the other person will get when they measure their end, but you have no way of knowing whether they've measured it yet or not. Nor do they have any way of knowing whether you've measured your side. In fact, if the two measurements are done soon enough that light doesn't have time to travel between them, then which one was measured first and which one was measured last is relative. Entangled particles do not signal each other. They have only correlation, not causation. No instant communication, no connection through the power of love. That's just not how it works. What can we do with quantum entanglement? That deserves a video of its own. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.